after the war, there was a real silence and shame and not wanting to talk about this episode. You still get a little reluctance of people to want to talk about this. More than 100,000 men, women, and children, all of Japanese ancestry, removed from their homes in the Pacific Coast state, two-thirds of the evacuees are American citizens by right of birth. The rest are their Japanese-born parents and grandparents. The Japanese internment camps established on the West Coast under the Roosevelt administration are well documented. But far less well known are the camps established in Hawaii immediately following the attack on Pearl Harbor. Japan and the U.S. had been kind of on this road towards war since the early part of the 1900s. And um, because of that and because of this large resident Japanese population in Hawaii, there was this fear of well, what was going to happen should war come between the two countries. So since the 1920s, um, various um, intelligence agencies, the Office of Naval Intelligence, the Army, G2, the FBI, were kind of keeping tabs on the local Japanese population. By the eve of Pearl Harbor, all of these agencies, which were kind of coordinated, the FBI was, took the preeminent role. They already knew exactly what they were going to do in the, in the event of war. And indeed, when Pearl Harbor was, was attacked on December 7. That day, they sprung into action and started detaining people on those lists that they had been compiling. They kind of had a point system where a Buddhist priest or a Shinto, that got you on the list. If you were a Christian, not so much, right? Because that was seen as more, more American, quote unquote. Um, Japanese language school teachers, uh, newspaper editors like my grandfather, um, one of the biggest categories were what they called consular agents, which sounds ominous, but what it really meant were uh, immigrant generation community leaders who uh, were sort of go-betweens between the community and the consul general's office because, among other prohibitions, uh, Japanese immigrants could not become U.S. citizens. In Hawaii in particular, um, the story gets really buried after the war. On the mainland, the, I think it was understood that you did nothing wrong. I mean, everybody who was of Japanese descent uh, got thrown into camp. Here it was just select people who got, or select families that were affected. And I think for many years, members of those families didn't want to talk about it because at some level they felt like they were culpable in some way or they had done something wrong. Uh, even you know, in the work that we've done uh, recently to try to uncover that story, you still get a little reluctance of people to want to talk about this. Because so much went unspoken for so many years, very little was known about the camps themselves. Until now. We found people who said, it's over here, no, it's over there. But more people we found who said, I didn't know Hawaii had internment camps. And even some who said, I didn't know Hawaii had internees. Jane Kurahara is a researcher at the Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii. She made it her personal mission to uncover as much as she could about Hawaii's mysterious internment camps. Here was this important part of history slipping away, very thinly documented, very few people knowing about it, and it was in danger of being lost. It's a very well hidden camp now that we know where it is. And it isn't until you're almost on top of it it, that you realize you're there. These are some of the ruins of the camp discovered by Kurahara and the museum. They are now working with the landowners who have volunteered to open the site up to the public within the next year. When you're there, then you understand uh, what they must have gone through. It's hot and it's humid. The internees called it Jikokudani, which means Hell Valley. Once you get that sense, you think, why were they here? You know, we study history, not specifically to learn about the past, but to learn about the present and the future. And I think one of the reasons there's been so much focus on the Japanese American story during World War II is because of the obvious parallels to what we see happening today, especially in the wake of what happened after 9-11 and the almost reflexive desire to kind of demonize certain segments of the population who just look like the enemy. It's very important that we learn lessons from history, especially when they have big ideas like this, where discrimination, uh, when you don't even know the other person, is, has this very negative impact on people. And you should be sensitive to others and try to treat each other with respect and dignity. And that's why I think it's a timeless, um, important life lesson. Thank you.